Hello everyone and a very good evening to you all. Myself Solu Gautam and today on behalf of Mirai team, I'll be hosting this current session and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you who have been connected with us through our iTux webinar. Well, I would like to thank you all for taking the time out from your heavy schedule and marking our program with your glorious presence. Thank you for joining with us this evening and also don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel for being updated to our programs even in the upcoming days. For now, I would like to step forward to integrate today's session and also I would like to notify you all that we'll be having our discussion session at the end of the webinar. So if you get any queries in between the session, you can just drop them on our comment section. We will get back to you later on. Today, as a speaking delegate, we have Dr. Christine W. Saint, all the way from USA, who will be talking particularly about contacts for kids is measurement, selection, and dispatch. Before she begins, I would like to give her general introduction. Dr. Christine is an OD fellow in the Op American Academy of Optometry. She has done her sub specialty in advanced contact lens fitting, and also she is a professor of clinical ophthalmology and director of the contact lens service in University of Iowa Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Science. She is also the president and co-founder of the Scleral Lens Education Society and designer and founder of the iPrint Prosthetics Custom Impression Scleral Lens Technology. I welcome you, Dr. Christine, on behalf of Mirai Foundation and all our participants. Thank you so much for having me. This is very exciting. And I hope at some point I get to meet you all in person, but Zoom for now. Uh, this is a topic that is very dear to my heart. Uh, pediatric contact lenses are um, uh, can be challenging, but can be more rewarding than anything else you do in your practice. When you choose to go uh, to work and you fit these pediatric or these babies in contact lenses, it will last an entire lifetime. The vision that you develop goes well beyond uh, your own life and, and well into uh, their adulthood. Uh, by way of disclosures, I do some research. I have some unrestricted research grants and I am the president and owner of iPrint Prosthetics. Deciding to do pediatric contact lenses is your decision. And I really hope that uh, you embrace it and uh, you decide to make it your own. This lecture today is going to go into some subtle things that they don't teach in, uh, in, in the textbooks. So I hope that it's very enlightening today. Feel free to contact me at any time if you have any questions. Our responsibility for babies uh, is, is a little different than it is to adults. We have to recognize problems early and we have to constantly educate ourselves and others about uh, uh, pediatric problems and we have to correct them early. If we do not correct these problems early, it's not like we get to have a do-over in 10 or 20 years. We have to do it early or they will not be able to see the rest of their lives. We have to know all our treatment options because not all families are the same, which means a, what works for one family or one child is not gonna work for another. The other thing is we have to co-manage with, when it comes to pediatrics, it's not just co-managing with, uh, with ophthalmology or other subspecialties within the eye care uh, realm. We often have to co-manage with uh, other specialties altogether. Uh, for example, endocrinology or neurology or uh, plastics uh, professions to, in order to uh, correct the baby's problems. There are some barriers to co-managing. I love this picture here because in this picture we have cornea service, the glaucoma service, the retina service. We have a, a pediatric uh, surgical team there to correct the eye, to help with the uh, other abnormalities on this child as well. Uh, often the barriers are we don't have the money or we don't have the facilities. I'm really hoping to show you some techniques today that uh, can be very low cost uh, and very portable, very manageable. You don't have to have high tech resources to do it. Uh, why do children wear contact lenses? 
I, I roughly am going to lump these into sort of medical reasons or cosmetic reasons. I'm not really going to talk about the cosmetic reasons today. That's another, another lecture. Uh, today, I'm going to really uh, concentrate on different pathologies and then visual development of, of children. So what are the indications for uh, specifically in the pediatric population? We typically think of things like high refractive error, like aphakia or astigmatism or anisometropia, uh, keratoconus to a lesser extent. What I work with in the, my peds cases mostly is either aphakia or these congenital birth defects that children have. Uh, uh, trauma is often a cause in older children. Uh, and then neurotrophic disease, where diseases where uh, they have some type of systemic disease where they either can't shut their eyes, they don't have eyelids, or uh, they have something like Stevens-Johnson syndrome or graft-versus-host disease. Aphakia, this is a whole topic in and of itself, but it's the most common indication for pediatric contact lenses. Uh, certainly it is in my practice as well. And there are some considerations that we need to think about with this population, and I will go into that later. High refractive errors. Uh, so if we break down where we see some of these refractive errors, children with albinism will always have three to four diopters of astigmatism. Uh, it is something that we need to think about. You either need to correct that uh, fully in the glasses or if they have nystagmus, put them in contact lenses because it will slow the nystagmus down. But then you're going to have to deal with the astigmatism on their cornea. Uh, Marfan syndrome children have extremely flat corneas. On average, Marfan, Marfan syndrome have corneas that are going to be below 40 diopters. So they're very, very flat. This is, uh, can be difficult to keep a contact lens on a Marfan syndrome eye because they, if they are a phakic, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the lens is gonna drop down, it's gonna be pushed down. If they're not a phakic, they're probably extremely myopic. And again, there's a lot of weight and volume to that lens. If the lens is displaced in Marfan's, you should check the vision through the, um, <clears throat> the lens and through the aphagic crescent, if they have it. Sometimes the children will see better aphagically than they will through their, their own uh, intraocular lens. Children with Stickler syndrome, also very highly myopic uh, and fever, uh, family or, familial erosive vitreal retinopathy, extremely, high, uh, extremely myopic. <clears throat> and then in children with high hyperopic astigmatism, just high hyperopic astigmatism, are going to be more prone to having amblyopia. And so you need to correct the hyperopia and the astigmatism together, and that can prove some challenges. These kids do better in some type of rigid correction uh, as far as visual development than they do in a soft contact lens. So while it may be tempting to say you wanna put that child in a soft contact lens, they will actually do better uh, with a gas perm option. If you think you have keratoconus in your pediatric population, make absolutely sure that you don't have keratoglobus. True keratoconus itself is very rare in the pediatric population, uh, but keratoglobus, and, and so if you start seeing those changes, really think keratoglobus, look at the whole cornea. And this is going to be somebody that needs ocular protection because they are gonna be more likely to, to rupture uh, especially if they're a busy, busy child. Trauma is uh, quite common. This, this uh, picture here on, on the, uh, the right is a, a little girl who fell on a pair of scissors as she was running. Uh, the picture on the left is a child who had uh, things stuck on his ceiling and it fell down and hit him into the eye, a mobile fell and, and hit him in the eye. So, there are about as many ways to um, uh, injure an eye as you can, it can possibly think of. And just when I think I've heard it all, I, I see another story come through. But you need, when it comes to trauma, we need to be thinking about uh, how are we going to uh, protect this eye? And is our goal going to be visual rehabilitation or cosmetic rehabilitation uh, in this 
one here of the little girl with the scissors that was in her eye. She had a very high mound on her, um, uh, on her uh, limbus and that actually precluded at the time fitting a, uh, a scleral contact lens on her. So we had to do a corneal contact lens. Over time, her pupil was so dragged that she couldn't get through the optics of a corneal contact lens and we had to come up with something different. Today, uh, this would be somebody we would do an elevation specific contact lens on and go up and over that bump altogether. The patient here on the left has traumatic aniridia. And so we need to decide if we need to put a, an iris ring on that contact lens, if the astigmatism is, is the real issue, or if we need to do a combination of an iris ring and then piggyback a contact lens. You can see here uh, in this eye, we have a mini scleral contact lens on this child to begin with. So let's think about some congenital abnormalities. A newborn has a very small eye, about nine and a half to 10 and a half millimeters is the horizontal iris diameter. And that grows quite quickly, about 90% of the growth happens within the first year of life. So if you are fitting a newborn, you really need to be thinking about what size contact lens and how frequently you're going to see that child because it will change quite dramatically, quite quickly. This is fine, you just need to keep up on it. I, uh, I, my earliest youngest patient that I have fit was really within a couple of days of, of life and uh, very tiny eyes. But the, the quicker we get vision to them, the better the vision development is and the less chance that we're going to have uh, nystagmus uh, develop into that child. If the child is born with microcornea, this would be a, an eye that's less than 10 millimeters or less than nine millimeters in the newborn. Uh, it gets a little more tricky to fit these lenses. It gets quite hard to fit a gas permeable lens on an eye that's maybe seven or eight millimeters. And this would, in today's world, this would be an eye that I would go ahead and start fitting with a scleral contact lens. You do have to be quite um, uh, up on it to change that lens very frequently uh, within, I'm gonna be, give you some dates here, but usually around four to six weeks, you have to make a change. And then again, around four to six months, you have to change the size of the, uh, the lens to fit on the globe. Uh, microcornea is often, uh, associated with other problems such as cataract or coloboma. Uh, if they're not, if they don't have a cataract, they're usually highly myopic or they have persistent hyperplastic primary vit vitreous. In a small eye, the lens grows normally, but the eye does not grow as fast. And so they are at risk in phagic children with microphthalmia, they are at significant risk for developing Ooh. glaucoma we have to consider either fitting with very small diameters or going with a, uh, a, a corneal scleral or a scleral contact lens. Uh, oftentimes, as I mentioned, these contact lenses are quite heavy. They have an anterior displacement of the, of the center of gravity and they fall down. You can see in this child over here, she's been wearing contact lenses since she was a newborn. She has eight millimeter corneas, they're quite tiny and her contact lenses just ride very, very low. This is actually quite comfortable to her. Her pupil is covered. So you are not necessarily going to get the best fits in these children. But what you need to do is make sure you just have the pupil covered with the optics, optics of the lens. Megalocornea is probably less common than microcornea, at least in the population that I see. And this would be a child that has a greater than a 13 millimeter cornea. These are frequently associated with high myopia or some uh, extent of myopia. The most common problem that I see in people with, or people of, of any age and certainly children with megalocornea is uh, they try to fit them in just a standard soft contact lens. And that is not appropriate. You have to go to a custom lens here. You have to measure the iris diameter and then, and then choose a contact lens that's appropriate for the size of the eye. Typically, you're going to be looking at uh, greater than 15 millimeters, usually a 16 and maybe even a 17 millimeter contact lens. A, a standard 14, 14 and a half millimeter lens are not going to fit these, these patients. If there's any astigmatism, these lenses won't stay stable on the eye. I frequently see people when they have failed other options. Megalocornea, if it's not just congenital megalocornea, 
uh, can uh, show up in the presence of glaucoma where the eye is stretched out. And in this case, you can see here, we see this, this patient here with Hobstria. They can also be highly myopic if they are not a phagic. If they are a phagic, then uh, they will have a, um, a, a lower uh, hyperopic prescription. Uh, what you have to be careful here is if you're going to fit these patients in scleral lenses, the trend right now is to go for scleral lenses. What's going to happen is it's very easy to land the contact lens on the limbus and end up with stem cell failure or stem cell stress that will induce some panis onto the eye uh, and have some long-term complications. Also, in these patients, if they do have glaucoma, they will frequently proceed to needing a tube shunt into the eye. And if you do have a tube shunt, you have to take that into consideration because you do not want to erode the tube shunt uh, and, uh, and develop endophthalmitis in the eye. Uh, here's an example of a young man <clears throat> with a tube shunt here. He has, we actually, for a while, we notched around that. I actually just saw him uh, last, uh, last Thursday and the lens just kind of went up and over the, uh, the, the, the patch graft now uh, because we can develop these elevation specific peripheries and just model the actual shape of the cornea and uh, avoid uh, erosion problems altogether. Here's an example of a tube shunt erosion. Uh, you need to make sure that you are always checking for the tube shunt erosions and you want to check IOP uh, immediately after your lens removal to make sure that you have not increased uh, the intraocular pressure in the eye. Or conversely, um, if you have eroded, uh, you want to make sure that the pressure isn't too low. Here's a, uh, in Peter's anomaly, this is one that you will infrequently see, but it is visually devastating and often a very sad situation uh, for the parents and the child. Peter's type one is usually unilateral. These are infrequent, infrequently come to in, into my practice because they usually have one good eye. And if the child has one good eye, we tend to uh, focus our attention on protection of the good eye uh, and, and while we might try to rehabilitate the, the, uh, the bad eye, it is not as common. When you have a Peters type two anomaly, this is usually bilateral and we have to do something or the child is gonna go blind. They typically uh, end up needing some type of a corneal transplant because the lens is adhered and the iris is adhered to the back of the cornea and the cornea becomes opaque. Unfortunately, with these children, they have other uh, issues that are associated with frequently uh, cardiac defects, frequently facial deformities um, and, and other issues as well. That, that photo that I showed you earlier with everybody in the room was uh, a, an exam under anesthesia and all these other doctors that were managing these other abnormalities were in the room at the same time, taking advantage of the exam under anesthesia. Uh, here's, here's that little baby. Uh, I want to point out here how tiny these eyes are. This opening here, the whole entire globe is only 10 millimeters. The whole eye is very, very tiny, which means you're going to be working with some extreme circumstances with Peter's anomaly. It is difficult, but it is worth it. And if you don't do it, who will? Are we subjecting this child to be blind the rest of their life or are we going to try? Sometimes people say to me, I don't know how you do what you do, but I only have up to go. I'm not, uh, I'm not like performing LASIK where I'm taking a perfectly healthy eye and subjecting it. I'm taking these very ill eyes and either I'm going to make it better or it's going to be exactly the same. I can only have a positive trajectory here. Um, here's another eye uh, that I want uh, to point out here. This eye, this is not iris. This is sclera. The eye uh, here is four millimeters. The whole cornea of this child is four millimeters. On this child, I created a scleral contact lens to correct the vision. The whole entire scleral contact lens was 10 millimeters wide. Unfortunately, these children tend to do very poorly. They have to be monitored very, very carefully. 
uh, I, our colobomas can really appear anywhere. Here's this child uh, that was born with an eyelid coloboma and had to have a contact lens made that, that covered up the entire globe. His parents call this eye his silly eye. Um, the, uh, you can have a microcornea here in this, in this uh, situation here with another iris coloboma. Uh, again, very tiny cornea. So how you fit these contact lenses is going to determine of what your, your final outcome wants to be. In this small eye over here, we initially uh, fit the contact lens. This was many years ago uh, with a, uh, a gas permeable lens. And as the child grew older, we actually ended up uh, putting on a um, just a brown tinted contact lens to make the eye bigger. Uh, and then I piggybacked a gas permeable lens on top of it. Believe it or not, this eye was 2040 fully corrected, which is pretty impressive. Uh, other issues, and this is where I tend to go more towards scleral lenses. So if it's just a refractive problem, I tend to go towards a, a corneal gas permeable lens. If it is a, an ocular surface issue or a protection issue, I tend to go towards scleral contact lenses. Okay, so you want to check for a, oh, my picture didn't put in there. You want to check for a Bell's reflex, meaning before you decide to fit anything, have the child blink quite strongly to see if their eyes roll up. If the eye is completely covered, you often don't have to fit them in any contact lens. If their eye does not roll up and get completely covered on the blink, that's when you need to consider ocular protection. Um, Congenital corneal anesthesia is, is quite rare. And unfortunately, um, I do have a number of these cases in my practice. And what ends up happening is uh, because there's a defect in the fifth cranial nerve, these, these corneas are neurotrophic. And as such, they start to break down and end up with these corneals, these very strange corneal scars. We have to fit them with scleral lenses to cover as much of the globe as possible to keep the cornea moist and as a tear reservoir. But this child here has um, what's called Mobius syndrome. Again, that's a defect in the fifth cranial nerve. He has absolutely no muscles of uh, facial expression, so he cannot smile, he can't uh, change his face whatsoever. Um, and, and because of that, he cannot blink. He uh, also has a, a seventh nerve palsy as well. Uh, he cannot blink. And so he developed this dense corneal scar. Unfortunately, this child also is deaf, which does, is not part of the Mobius syndrome. His parents just happen to be deaf. And so he's congenitally deaf. So his only form of communication was through sign language. His parents brought him to me because he was progressively going blind and losing his ability to sign or to see what his parents were signing to him. This was when I first saw him back in 2013. I fit him with a scleral lens at that time. And here's where he is in 2018. So you see how that scar has really regressed over time. Children have an amazing ability to heal their scars and to, to repopulate the collagen in their stroma and, and to end up seeing much better. It, so this is a very rewarding area. If you have exposure keratopathy, even if you think you have quite a dense scar, it is very rewarding to fit them in contact lenses because you can resolve the scar and then uh, create vision uh, for the rest of their life. Even when you have a little arc of pupil like this, you can get quite good vision through that cornea. This child now is pretty close to 20. So when you have a child that has a uh, persistent epithelial defect, uh, again, whether it's from uh, exposure or whether it's from corneal anesthesia, uh, this child down here in the small box uh, was a shaken baby, so had a lot of neurological defects. Uh, they had uh, done a tarsarophy and sewn his eyes shut, but of course that is gonna be deeply amblyopic, uh, amblyogenic, uh, and so they opened it up and we fit that child with a scleral contact lens. If you're going to manage these children with scleral contact lenses for resolution of these epithelial defects, there's several steps that you need to take to make sure that you have uh, secured uh, the proper documentation. One is take a photo. 
take a photo in white light, take a photo in the cobalt light, and really document the progression of this epithelial defect. Uh, I would recommend, and this is probably the only time I will recommend extended wear of any contact lens device on a child, and then you need to monitor it daily. That doesn't mean that you have to see the patient in your practice daily. I, uh, I find that parents uh, and, our, and our cell phones are incredibly good these days. So I have the, patient, the parents take pictures and send them to me to make sure that I can monitor. It's surprising uh, how much we can do over the internet. And I think COVID pushed this a little bit faster for, uh, but we can really monitor these things daily that way. I dispense an antibiotic and I have them use it, uh, I have them use it um, twice a day. Um, and then I have them take out the contact lens and clean it twice a day uh, as well, disinfect it, refresh the reservoir fluid. Uh, and then uh, of course I document, document, document because you're at risk for losing these eyes, you're at risk for endophthalmitis, uh, but you're also at risk for losing the eye if you do nothing. You know if you do nothing, you're going to lose that eye. Here's an example of how quickly these defects will heal underneath uh, a scleral contact lens. So children also can have some systemic diseases that are pretty severe. And probably the most common one that I see is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And this is a severe allergic reaction, uh, typically to an antibiotic, but I have certainly seen it to, you know, acetaminophen or ibuprofen or a, 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 a hydroxychloroquine, I mean, a host of other drugs that are out there. Um, these children are very, very st sick. There's basically two forms of this, just regular Stevens-Johnson, and then there's what we call the TENS overlay or the toxic epidermal necrosis overlay. And that is a much more severe form of it. And when there's a TENS overlay, these are the children that are, tend to end up back in your practi practice. They can be systemically ill for a lifetime, uh, they tend to develop uh, uh, limbal stem cell loss and glaucoma and a host of other issues that you then have to deal with with a contact lens. So one of the things that always happens is contracture of the eyelid when you have this severe ocular form of Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which will turn the eyelids in and causing uh, kisses and scraping of cornea, which induces limbal stem cell loss and induces a significant amount of pain. Typically, the first thing that they do with these children is what's called hypercation, where they scrape or remove the, the uh, terminal end bulbs of the, of the lashes and, and or cryo freeze them off uh, to uh, make it so the lashes will not grow back. Uh, pretty typical is this limbal stem cell or panis uh, that develops uh, the, really it's not, it's not the contact lens that causes this. This is the natural progression of the disease. And I have had many doctors, you know, email me photos and say, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? How do I change the fit? So this doesn't happen. It's going to happen. There's nothing that you really can do about it. We're trying to keep the eye comfortable uh, and, and hopefully keep the eye seeing, but there's not a lot you can do about this panis and this limbal stem cell loss. Maybe in the future, we'll have some stem cell replacements that work, work better. It's a very hostile environment. And over time, we're gonna see keratinization of all the mucous membranes. You're gonna see keratinization of, here's an example of where they hypercated the lashes, um, but the, the lid margin becomes keratinized, but not only the lid margin, down into the conjunctiva on the lid margin also becomes keratinized. And the conjunctiva, the globe itself, will become keratinized over time. It is just what happens. If you protect the globe, if you keep a covering on the entire globe, you can prevent that keratinization, but it is still gonna happen on the lid margin. I just want to point out this eyelid that I have flipped over here. There's a tiny island of conjunctiva in the, uh, the rest of the lid margin is fibrotic. If you land a contact lens right on that tiny little space of conjunctiva, it's going to be quite uncomfortable. So with these eyes, uh, I recommend typically going very big to cover up as much as you possibly can. Of course, the problems that you run into is that you can have some blepharon that form and adhere it to the globe. And that may limit how big of a contact lens you can put on an eye. 
in today's world where we can do these elevation specific or free form contact lenses, if you have a symblepharon, you can literally create the scleral contact lens to go up and over that symblepharon uh, without causing any impingement. Okay. Because lenses no longer have uh, to be symmetrical. Excuse me, doctor. Yeah. Okay, doctor, I have a one interest uh, for the question. Like uh, in the symblepharon, is there any systematic disease or is it due to the other reason? The symblepharon is due to the um, uh, the the Stevens Johnson syndrome. It can you can we can also see it in uh, graft versus host disease. So any time where there's a chronic smoldering inflammation, we can form symblepharons to the eye. You know, you you might think you want to lice it or cut it, but it nothing nothing good will happen if you cut that symblepharon. Uh, because remember, it's a, it's a smoldering uh, inflammatory process. And if you were to cut the, the symblepharons, they form granulomas and the whole eye becomes very, very inflammatory. So it is better to work around the symblepharon or prevent the symblepharons by fitting a really big contact lens before they form uh, than to try to lice it or cut it or remove it. But it's, it's an inflammation process. So in today's world, we don't have to have lenses that are symmetric anymore. And this is quite of help for these really severe cases uh, in that baby but, uh, that showed without the eyelid with the coloboma. This is his lens. And you can see we create this non-round lens so that we can cover as much of the eyeball as possible. We can create, if somebody has a lot of keratinization on their temporal conjunctiva, we can create a contact lens that actually is wider in the horizontal meridian than it is in the vertical meridian so that it's not difficult to put on the child or the adult. Uh, we can create these contact lenses that have these wavy bumps in them to go up and over whatever the irregularities of the eye are. Uh, graft versus host disease is always a very sad situation with these children they hurt. This little boy here, he, uh, he was 10 years old and he couldn't go to school because his eyes hurt so much. He told me that he hurt so much that he would rather die than keep hurting like he is. And he was 10 years old. He's got so much ahead of him, so much life to live. And so we fit him in a scleral contact lens as big as we possibly could go, again, with as much coverage in the horizontal meridian as possible. And uh, you can see he had quite a good response. He is, he's back to school. Well, he was back to school. Um, he's, nobody's in school right now. Um, and he's just a very, just a different person. Just personality is different. Um, you know, his mom even tells me, you know, how much of a joy he is and how happy he is about life again. So even though these, these cases are complicated, feel like you can take them on because the difference you make is unbelievable. Um, I, I tear up just thinking about these children because I love them all so much. Um, but you can see, you know, when you don't have the lens on, they form these filaments. They have this filamentary keratitis. But after they wear the lens, it just the filaments just come right off and they are so much more comfortable. Um, I will initially put children in a soft bandage contact lens while I'm trying to figure out the scleral contact lens on their eye just to give them some relief. Ultimately, though, they almost always need a scleral contact lens. All right, so let's talk about what's in a fit. How do we actually do this, right? So maybe I've motivated you that you want to do it or maybe I've motivated you that you want somebody else to do it. But um, what, how do we actually go about a fitting? So the lens obviously needs to provide optimal refractive correction, but it also needs to have a good mechanical fit. It needs to be comfortable. The eye needs to tolerate it well. And the parents and the child need to be able to handle the lens well. And so those are all things that we think about. Every time you go to fit a, a lens on a child or an infant, you need to be thinking all of these things together. Um, so specific to infants, we want to maximize the oxygen permeability. We want lenses that have extended parameters because these children are frequently plus 24s or minus 24s. 
Uh, we need uh, wider parameters of base curves, diameters. We need to be able to reproduce them. Uh, and we need to have them honestly uh, in, in a price point that we can, we can manage over a lifetime. Uh, and they need to have, be able to have medications put on top of it, whether it's glaucoma medications or antibiotics um, or, uh, you know, cyclogel, you know, a dilation drop or uh, lubricants. Uh, so the type of contact lenses that we're going to talk about today are silicone-based lenses, gas permeable or rigid, if you will, type of lenses, and, and uh, regular plastic, regular old old HEMA lenses. So silicone lenses, I don't know if you have these available to you. Um, they are not my favorite, to be honest. When I see a silicone lens or Silsoft lens on a patient's eye, I frequently think um, that they didn't know what else to put on the eye and it was the only thing they had and eh, it's kind of sort of close. So, you know, maybe it'll be okay. It's better than nothing. Um, but that's not what I'd want for my child. And uh, I certainly don't want that for other people's children as, as well. The advantages of a Silsoft lens is technically it's pretty easy to fit. It's easy to fit because you don't have that many options. Um, it is oxygen transmissible. Uh, uh, there's a fairly low lens, uh, lens loss rate, pretty easy to handle, and the parameters are written on the lens. The disadvantage is it's really expensive. These lenses, to be honest, need to be replaced at least monthly. Um, I, I, again, I don't know if you have them there, but in the US, my cost on this lens is $160. That's a lot of money throughout the year to replace that contact lens. Um, people who say it doesn't need to be replaced monthly need to step back, listen to what I'm gonna say, and then seriously think about it again. Um, they're very, silicone is very hydrophobic. And as such, it has a coating on the surface that wears off almost like that. And then, then you develop a lot of lipid deposits and a lot of calcium deposits and the lens becomes opaque. I have actually seen Silsoft lenses uh, not cleaned, not replaced frequently enough that have actually induced amblyopia onto a child compared to helping correct oh, that. Yes. Okay. Uh, they're very limited powers. So we only have basically three base curves, seven, five, seven, seven, and seven, nine for infants, small diameters, limited power availability. And they only come in three doctor steps. Here you can see the lens powers are written on the side of the lens. Here's where it gets easy, right? The first year of life, you fit the seven, five, the second year of life, you fit the seven, seven, and the third year of life. And after that, you fit the uh, seven, nine. So that seems pretty straightforward. But here's the problem. The lenses have this, uh, it's almost like water beaded up on a waxed car uh, situation that goes on with them. And that actually causes patching to the eye. So it actually reduces the vision that the patient's getting to the eye. I've had a patient who has had a lens in one eye, the lens fell out of the other eye and the lens that wasn't corrected at all, the aphicic eye that wasn't corrected at all had better vision than the eye that, was, that had the old dirty contact lens in it. And this happens after about a month. Okay. The other problem is because there's only so many base curves, when you're putting the lens on a tiny infant, they develop this gap in the lens. And when you have this little gap in the lens, it actually goes across the entire lens, buckles up, and it actually induces astigmatism, induces cylinder to the optics of the eye. So I have pretty much, I, I have higher standards and uh, I've, less expensive lenses that I can fit on a baby. And, and so I, I do that. Um, custom made silicone hydrogel lenses. Uh, here we have them in the definitive Contamac material. Uh, and they're, they're pretty good. I find the reproducibility to be a little bit difficult, but certainly better as far as the knee vascularization into the cornea. So hydrogel lenses, a wide variety of lenses, very inexpensive. Uh, you can tint them. So I will sometimes do a tinted lens uh, for a child that wants to have that cosmetic appearance. Um, the advantage is they stay in place and they're pretty relatively inexpensive. Um, but the disadvantage of course, is they have a low oxygen permeability. You have to replace them frequently. Uh, and, but the real problem is sometimes they can be a little difficult to handle. 
um, and they don't mask any irregularity. Okay. But you can get them in almost anything that you want, right? Plus 50 to minus 75, any base curve, any diameter, any astigmatism. So there's a lot of options there that come with hydrogel lenses. But my primary lenses that I use in my practice are gas permeable materials, either in a corneal design or in a scleral lens design. The advantage of a corneal gas perm lens is that they're very inexpensive. I, I don't know about there, but if I really needed to, I could get a gas perm lens for about $18. Um, and sometimes I find myself in the position of having to purchase the contact lens for the baby, uh, which I frequently do because I need to live with myself and I cannot let a baby go blind on my watch. Um, and so I will uh, at least purchase the initial lenses until I can set up a system for that baby to get, get the lenses paid for. There's quick lab turnaround, good reproducibility. They're easy to verify. You can verify them yourself. You know which lens that you're working with. Easy to handle on and off as a breeze with these ones. Um, excellent optics. Here's the best part about it though. With the optics, you put that on, it doesn't matter how much cylinder is on that cornea. You have masked that cylinder. And so you can get the power. Sometimes with these kids, you only get one streak and you better know if that's with or against. You don't have the luxury of sitting there being able to do every single meridian. So with a, a corneal gas perm lens, you mask all that cylinder and, and then you can get the power uh, pretty quickly. They're also UV protected, which is important for these aphic children and certainly high, high oxygen. The risk of infection with corneal gas permeable lenses is very minimal. As a matter of fact, it runs about the same risk or incident of infection that children who don't wear contact lenses at all have. So it's a very safe way of wearing the contact lens. Uh, the disadvantage is in older children, infants and young children don't notice the difference. In older children, and now I'm talking maybe eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, they will have a little bit of an adaptation lag like an adult will. Um, you have to know what you're doing in order to fit it. And of course you can have the lens pop out of the eye uh, if, it's, if it's not fit or if the child grows or the fit changes. Uh, scleral contact lenses, the advantage to those is really much the same as the gas perm lenses. However, they are more expensive uh, and they can really be a little bit more difficult to fit. So I would, uh, if, if you're just new to fitting contact lenses on children, I would start with the gas permeable lenses because they're easier and then work your way into doing the scleral lenses. Uh, when you're fitting scleral lenses, it's really about managing the disease under the lens and not as much about the contact lens itself. So you have a lot to learn. Gas permeable lenses are pretty much available in any power. Yes, the child could blink over that contact lens, believe it or not. Uh, any base curve, any toric, any diameter. Basically, when you're dealing with a gas permeable material, you can get whatever you want. As a control freak, that makes me very happy. All right, so the fit. How do we go about fitting it? Well, I tend to do everything in clinic. I want to be in clinic with my patient. I don't feel I ever need to sedate them unless the child is incredibly rambunctious or if the child is going under for another reason, right? If the child is, is going uh, under anesthesia for you know, some other procedure, I will jump in and, and uh, do the fitting while they are asleep. But typically I don't feel that I need to. Items that you need for examination, uh, you need to your retinoscope, trial lenses, and your fitting sets, whether you're going to do corneal or scleral, your solutions, fluorescein, you need some type of slit lamp. Typically, here I have a, a slit lamp, but honestly, I typically use a cobalt light and my 20 diopter lens seems to work uh, just fine. I do not typically take K readings because it doesn't actually matter. Your contact lens is the best topographer you're ever going to have. And uh, so I just put lenses on until I get the, the right fit. I'm a pretty good guesser. I'm gonna show you my guesses as we go along here. And I typically don't use preparacaine, uh, not just when they're under anesthesia, but in general, because I may have one shot of, of doing something to that child. I don't want that one shot to be getting a drop of preparacaine in, which will hurt, which the patient will then not let me touch them to do anything else. If I only need to do one thing, I need to get a contact lens on the eye and I can make all of my estimations from that point. 
Never underestimate the power of a treat drawer. If you have treats for the child, you get that contact on their eye and immediately give them something to look through so they can pull out a toy or start playing with a toy. They will forget all about that contact lens. So this lower left or lower, I guess, right one for you is uh, what I typically use. I use a, it's a five LED flashlight in cobalt blue and either my rat and filter or my 20 diopter lens. Uh, you can get a 20 diopter lens in uh, yellow. That's actually very helpful. Uh, the uh, Burton lamps do not give enough um, light and it is very difficult to, to look at subtle fluorescein patterns with a Burton lamp. So your Burton lamp is of no use to you anymore. You can throw that away. Um, and then of course, as soon as the child's not a bobblehead anymore, you can put the child into the slit lamp. So somewhere around four or five months when the child has a little more stiffness in their neck, just put them up to the slit lamp and that's the easiest way to look. My, um, my light gets disinfected a lot uh, because it's very frugal. I call it my magic wand and my kids love to hold the magic wand with them. Uh, a little tip here is I actually use my phone quite a bit and I will either take video or take photos uh, of the fit itself. If I'm not getting a great view, I actually take some photos or take some video and then I can scroll through that and make it bigger. I'm not saying I'm a presbyo, but you know, I make that a little bit bigger and I can really see what that fluorescein pattern looks like on the, on the child. Another pro tip is something I call flying the baby. And so if you take your uh, baby, any baby, it, uh, as soon as they're not a bobblehead anymore and you, and even if they're screaming and they're crying and they've got their eyes all squinched up, the minute you fly the baby up in the air, their eyes will pop open and you will be able to see that contact lens fit. So take your, your flashlight, your cobalt flashlight, have somebody fly the baby up and you stand there and you, you shine that flashlight in their eyes and you will be able to see that fluorescein pattern in the fit. I also uh, give this tip to the parents so that they're not fighting the child. They get their contact in and they fly the baby. The baby's all happy, it's all a game. And the parents can make sure that the contact lenses are in the correct position. Uh, another tip is I call baby belling. And what this is, is if the baby's crying and the eyes are rolled up into the head and you can't see the fit, if you turn the baby upside down and bring the baby back up again, the eyes will come down into the center. Um, turn the baby down and bring them up. And you turn the baby down and you bring the baby up. And then the eyes are centered again. And you can take a look at that, that contact lens fit. So fitting the actual lens for gas permeable lenses, you want to go about one millimeter smaller than the iris diameter. Uh, for scleral lenses, it's going to uh, depend on the reason and the necessity for the pathology of the eye. I tend to be a, I tend to fit on the bigger side uh, when it comes to contact lenses, because if I'm putting somebody in a scleral lens, it's typically for ocular pathology that's going to uh, require protection of the eye, you know, like an exposure situation. Um, however, uh, some people fit, if I were to fit an aphakic guy, for example, I probably would go with a smaller lens, um, a mini scleral lens. Um, you want to really can measure the aperture of the eye uh, and then determine how big of a contact lens that you can get into that eye. Really, once a child is over six months of age, you can do a full scleral, even up to about 18 millimeters um, and handle that lens quite well. I'll show you how to put that lens on in a little bit here. When we looked at 323 children that were fit in the University of Iowa, the average diameter for contact lenses was about nine millimeters up to six months, about 9.3 at 12 months, up six to 12 months, and at 9.8 uh, uh, older than that. So I tend to fit a little bit on the larger side. I would probably say this was about 10 years ago. I would probably say I average more towards that 9.8 diameter now. I use uh, 9.3. Uh, and 9.8, 9.3 up to about six months, and then 9.8 after that. Okay. There's two ways of measuring your base curve. Uh, you can measure it or you can guess. I'm a huge fan of guessing. I find that my auto refractor uh, or my handheld keratometer is nothing but uh, frustrating. And uh, I always joke that I just hold it in my hand and go, sit still. <laughs> I don't, I don't actually do that, but it just looks like a beating club to me. So I have pretty much abandoned my keratometer and I just put lenses on eyes. 
the average base curves, again, looking at this population of fits uh, from zero to six months was about 46 diopters, from six to 12 months was 45 diopters, and uh, at about 18 months, it was about 43 diopters. 43 is the average base curve of the adult population. So if you had to guess, pick something that falls into that range. And then at that point, you can tell if it's too steep or too flat and you can change it. So this really is this postcard view here. Um, you know, this is the view that you should, um, you should put into your practice to refer back to, but you want to fit on K, but you can look at it and say, that's a three diopter bubble, a two diopter bubble, one diopter steep. And once you get the fitting patterns down, you can just make your changes from there. When it comes to a uh, scleral lens, it's a little bit uh, more variable because it's really, um, it, it, with scleral lens, it's, it's not just a base curve issue, it's a vault issue, right? Because you get a flat vault <clears throat> with uh, a flat base curve with steep peripheral curves and have it be quite far away from the cornea, or you can have a very, very steep with very flat peripheral curves and have it be quite close to the cornea. So your base curve doesn't matter as much when it comes to fitting scleral lenses. And this is gonna be very fitting set dependent that you have. Um, but ideally you wanna put a lens on and have about 200 microns of clearance. Realistically, you're not going to be able to tell this much um, <clears throat> I, I, because it's just gonna be hard to see. You're gonna, because you're not gonna be able to measure it like you do with adults. You're just gonna have to guess. What I find is just put a fluorescein in the bowl of the lens, put it on the eye. And then if you've got, if you've got fluorescein over the entire cornea and the limbus, you're probably okay, um, certainly uh, to get things going. So you just wanna make sure you don't have touch in the center. You wanna make sure you don't have touch over the limbus. And then of course, you just wanna make sure you don't have compression anywhere on the eye. Uh, to determine the power. So average contact lens powers will decrease over time as the eye gets bigger and the eye grows. Uh, you certainly want to make sure you avoid off-axis retinoscopy or you're going to induce cylinder onto these eyes. You do want to put an aspheric front curve or aspheric power on this because these high powers are going to have a lot of um, spherical aberration on it. So you do want to make sure you have a little bit of an asphericity to control that spherical aberration. Uh, you want to over plus the child until about age two, uh, which you will start to decrease it and then eventually go into bifocal glasses. A baby's whole world is mommy's face. Um, and so you want to make sure that when they're, they're nursing or they're holding them that they, they have that focal distance. And then as they get older, uh, they push that out. So objective powers, um, they can be challenging. I typically tend to dilate the babies when I figure out, I'll put a, uh, a, just a drop of trapicamide in the eye to dilate uh, so that I have, it makes my life easier so that I can um, uh, check that power. Um, certainly uh, things like eccentric pupils or corneal scarring. Uh, it's retinoscopy, I cannot tell you how vitally important it is to be good at retinoscopy, not just to find power, but if you don't see a red reflex, either your power's way off or you've got some retinal pathology going on there that should clue you into something deeper is going on. Um, and then of course, don't forget to vertex the power. However, there's another way that you can do this. And sometimes when um, somebody is taking them up to the OR for various reasons, I have them do uh, an axial eye length on the eye. So if they find the axial eye length, uh, doing ultrasound, find the axial eye length of the eye, and then the, and then the depth of the um, anterior chamber, okay? I, what I do is I take the base curve of the contact lens as my K reading, and I run that through the IOL master uh, for uh, cataract surgery. And then I vertex it because that'll tell you what the power of the IOL is needed for that eye. And then using the anterior chamber depth, I vertex that back to uh, the corneal plane again. And it is unbelievable how accurate it is to do it this way. So if you have access to ultra, uh, ultrasonography, it's, it's really a brilliant way of, of determining the power of the eye. It works quite well. Changes in fit, it happens quite quickly. So we expect the uh, gas perm lens will start to pop out as scleral lens will start to become tight. 
The first change is about four to six weeks. The second one about four to six months. And the third change is about nine to 12 months within that first year of life. Much slower after that. Usually the next change is at about two years of age. Um, with the uh, gas perm lenses, people think that popping out is, is a problem. In reality, that's I, li I don't mind it because when the fit changes, the parents will call me up and say, everything's been going great, but you know, the last two days, I can't keep the lens in, it keeps popping out. It tells me that that baby's grown. And I really, that's when I need to be seeing the baby anyway. So I tell the parents to come right back in. But another thing that happens is if the eye were to suddenly grow a little bit and the lens starts popping out, it could also indicate that the pressure in the eye is too high and the pressure has gone up. And over the years, I have caught numerous children with IOP spikes that ended up needing uh, either medication or surgical intervention simply because the gas perm lens was popping out. It's one of the reasons I really go with GP lenses versus scleral lenses uh, for, for small children, children under one year of age. Um, with the uh, follow-up care for the first year of life, I usually see them monthly. Uh, and then I see them every three months. And then once they're over three, I see them about every six months. At this point, I usually have very solid relationships established with the parents. And I, I trust them to call me if they feel like something is not right. So application and removal. I, I frequently teach uh, everybody how to, I'm a big fan of empowerment and teaching people how to become uh, advocates for themselves, and certainly the parents and, and, and the children as well. And I will teach the child how to put the contact lens on their dolly. And then as they get old enough, I, because it's not scary then, and they are in charge, I will uh, then as they get old enough, you sometimes around four or five years old, I teach them to start taking the contact lens out, then to start putting it on. But I, uh, when I first started doing this about 25 years ago or so, I was told it's too much for the parents, it's too hard for the parents. And I was a little offended by that because as a parent, I want what is best for my child. And, um, and it is not too hard. The parents can definitely do this. Uh, there are multiple studies out that show uh, parents are more concerned about surgery than they are about putting the contact lens on and off the eye once they really understand what's all involved. So a lot of parents would rather do the contact lens than more surgery down the road. So biggest key is establish a daily ritual. The lens has to go on and off every single day. And this is for multiple reasons. One, the parent needs to become proficient at putting that lens on and off. But the child also needs to learn that that lens goes on and off every day. The child needs to become more cooperative and the children need routine. The biggest mistake I ever make as a parent is when I let my kids stay up late one night and then the next night, it's like trying to put a cat in the bathtub. You know, they're like, Arr! you know, they do not want to go to bed. It's because I got them out of the routine. It's the same way with children. It doesn't matter what the routine is, but if that child gets up, washes their face, context goes in and then they get breakfast, whatever the routine is, the child knows what's happening and kids do not like to be sneaked up on or feel attacked. Uh, they like to have control of their world. Uh, if you if you take it on and off every day and clean it every day, the lens is going to be more comfortable and it also decreases the risks of complications. We teach our children sign language uh, at about eight or nine months old. They will learn to sign in uh, this. We teach them this for contact and uh, the children will learn if they, they, can, they can sign before they can um, uh, actually talk and say that they have a problem or need attention for their contact lens. Children will also eat their contact lenses. Uh, they put everything in their mouth somewhere around that nine months to a year, everything starts going right in their mouth. And if you do happen to find it on the other end, uh, you can soak it in then straight up 3% hydrogen peroxide for three hours. This is gas perm materials we're talking about. Um, and inspect the lens. And if it's, if it's in good condition, you can go ahead and use it again. So it, it goes through undigested. Um, and you know, the first couple of times the parents seem to balk at this, but I'll tell you what, at about the third time a child eats that contact lens, they're usually calling me on the phone telling me, how do I clean this again? Um, 
So holding the child, uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can papoose, one person hold, two person hold. Um, so you can, uh, sit, sitting on the child is not really sitting on the child. You're actually hovering above it. And you can have somebody hold their arms above their head. And that way they can't move their head, their arms are like this, they can't move their head back and forth. Or conversely, you can turn the child around the other way and hold their head between your knees. Your knees are very strong. They can't move their head back and forth. And then you can have somebody else either lay on the child's legs or do the contact lens part for you. Um, I'm, I am very good at doing a one person hold. You only have to do this a couple of times before the child realizes that this is not the direction he wants to go in and will lay there quite still for you and, and not have to be a problem. But what we're doing here is you're literally not sitting on the child. You're hovering above the child. The arms are down at the side. The kid can kick all they want, but they're not going to be able to uh, hurt you or themselves. And their arms cannot get um, out from under you and their head is between that. This whole process should just take 30 seconds or less. Okay. Here's papoosing. This is what typically a child sounds like when you're trying to papoose them. They are not happy. I know, little one, right? And then you're getting up to hold the child between the legs. Okay. When you go to put the contact in, you can be right up there. You see, and the contact lens goes right in her eye. So you, I mean, I'll show this at a little greater um, magnification in a minute here. Can, oh well. you, you put it on the cheek, and then you just slide it up underneath the eye. Here's a less intensive uh, baby burrito, um, which is not as hot. You wrap it over the arm and under the butt. And then the child uses their own weight to hold the, the, um, the arms in place. So the arms don't get up there and can't get in your way while you're trying to put the contact lens in. See? Less hot and the baby can breathe. So they're not as hot. And they just don't feel like they're suffocating as much. Okay, eventually the child, you won't have to hold the child at all. In, in my practice, this typically, I see this typically around two maybe 18 months kids kids really want to get off and play i call i tell the parents you can either have your uh interaction with a child be frustrating or you can have it just be the way it is i call it spiraling up or spiraling down so the child uh if, if you just say this is the way it's going to be the lens is going on there's not room for discussion and once it's on you can go do your own thing the child will just stand there if the child if, if the child cries and the parent stops, um, the child will learn where the parent's buttons are and uh, the child will cry harder and harder and harder every time they do it. And it will turn out to be this knockdown, drag out fight. So the parents really do need to be in control of what's going on. So what might go wrong during this, you can drop the contact lens, rub the eyes. The eyes will get slippery. And I say wet eyelids are the kiss of death. So always make sure you have a, a, a tissue so that you can wipe the eyes uh, to keep those eyelids dry because wet eyelids are just miserable. And then if everybody gets too stressed, you need to walk away for a little bit and come back to it. Okay. So how to put a lens on the eye. This really doesn't matter if it's going to be a scleral lens or corneal lens, but you want to create a gap underneath that upper eyelid. This little gap right there is what you want. You take your thumb and the eyelashes and you peg the eyelashes to that brow bone and create that gap. You do not care what is happening on that lower eyelid. You just want to create that tiny little gap under there. And this is whether it's a scleral lens or whether it's a gas perm lens. You want to secure those lashes to the brow, put the contact lens on the lower lid, and then just push it up underneath the upper eyelid. Just push it on up. For a soft contact lens, you want to create that fan shape and then go ahead and do the same thing that I just talked. So you can hold the contact lens like a fan and create that gap and then just push it on up. Just keep with your finger. Just push, 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 push till it's up underneath that lid. Let go of the lower lid first, then let go of the upper lid. 
soft lens removal. Um, you just take it out like any soft contact lens, either wipe it out or pinch it out or pop it out like that. It depends, the higher the power, the easier it is to pop it out. Um, so gas perm insertion, this is my little baby, by the way. And just push it up. That's all there is to it. Wanna see that again? Just put it on that lower eyelid, create that gap, put it on that lower eyelid, and then just push it up. There you go. It's really not that hard. You do the same thing with a sclera lens, but you just need to fill it with um, um, like a gel, like sustained gel or gentile gel or some type of viscous gel. Um, to remove the contact lens, it really is all about the lid margins, right? It, uh, you put your fingers right at those lid margins, pull them apart, push it under the lens and pop it out. So there it is, lids, uh, fingers right at those eyelid margins. If you have your fingers too far away from the lid margins, you need to push down, not just pull out. You will flip the eyelid. If you flip the eyelid, you cannot get that contact lens out of the eye. You have to, pu you have to push the lid margin under under the contact lens. If you're just pulling it this way, you're gonna flip the eyelids over. You'll never get that contact lens out. You need to push the contact lens or the eyelids under the contact lens and pop it out. Eyes will be centered again. Yes. Okay. okay, so if their eye rolls up, you gotta turn them upside down. Okay. Right. Here we're taking the lens out. And then eyelid Can margins. See, I had to reposition my finger several times. Do you see that? And it pops right out. So that just kind of push the eyelids. We're going to try it one more time because you'll see you have to have the, I have to reposition my thumb so I don't flip that eyelid over. All right. And then upper eyebrow to that upper eyebrow bone. See, I was flipping the lid margin. Push it out. Okay. All right, scleral lens application face up. It's really the exact same way, but you completely fill the bowl with cellulose or sustained gel or gentile gel. I don't know what you have there, but some clear, thick saline type gel. Uh, be fast and have that tissue ready because eyelids are the kiss of death. Okay. If you're gonna do it in the face down position, I do it in the face up position probably 99% of the time. Uh, if I were to do it in the face down position, this is also my daughter, um, uh, you, what you need to do is have the child in your lap or laying on a bed and you do the, you insert it the same way. Uh, you would need to do it face down if you don't have a thickening agent. So if you only have saline, you have to do it in the face down position. So here's a video of putting lenses on a small child. You always want to wipe the lashes, wipe them from the down to, from the top of the eye to down so that you don't rub the eye. Wet eyelashes are the kiss of death. You peg those lashes to the upper brow bone to create that gap underneath that upper lid. Wipe the eye, take the lens. You don't have to have the lens filled if it's a corneal scleral lens because you won't have uh, a gap underneath it because it'll be close to the cornea. But for a full scleral lens, you will need to fill it in. This is in the face down position. As it's fold, you put it on the cheek. Again, that seals in this, the fluid, and then you push it on underneath that upper lid. 